Do you have some good stories of what you've experienced in life? Do you have a story in which you were in a mismatch? You were outmatched, maybe tricked by your daughter in front of people? Something, you know. This summer, we are coming together every week in worship, and we are saying to God, tell me a story. Tell me a story, God. Uh, And friends, if you'd like a good summer read, this is a really good book. And you will find insights for your life um, uh, from God's holy Bible. Today we have a story, as you've already been hearing, of an incredible mismatch. The takedown showdown between a human being and God. It's found in the book of Genesis, chapter 32, and we're going to pick up this story at verse 22. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions, so Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this story. Lord, may this story, your word, through your Holy Spirit, help us now, speak to us. Help me, Lord, help us with our reflections to hear your voice and that we might follow you in faith. Amen. Showdown, right? Some years ago, my uh, older brother gave me a fun little book as a gift called Who Would Win? It's uh, just an entertaining little book of imaginary showdowns between two forces. Who would win? And that's because when we were little, we would stay up way past our go-to-sleep time arguing over who would win. Could a hippo beat up an alligator? You know, just heady intellectual stuff like that. And so he gave me this. It was a fun reminder of our childhood talks. And uh, it poses great showdown questions. Can I try some on you? Sure, Andy. Um, Okay. Crosswords versus Sudoku. Who is the champ? How many say crosswords is the better puzzle? How many say Sudoku? How many don't really do either? Okay, good. All right, um, Winter Olympics versus Summer Olympics. Who is the champ Olympics? Summer? Winter? Good. All right, Summer clearly won. Hot dogs versus hamburgers. How many say hot dogs wins? Okay, hamburgers? Ooh, a clear champ. Okay, I can tell you're getting into it. Books? versus movie versions of books? Um, Okay, hands, how many say books? 
Whoa, okay. Movie versions of books. Marshall, you're our movie guy. All right. This one, now we're really getting into deep details. Coffee versus tea. Yeah. Oh, and remember, you're Presbyterians. How many say coffee? Okay, let's move on. We won. Okay, tea. You have, all right, I see you. Good. All right, good. Uh, this book has a charming uh, entry, and I thought it was humorous. Uh, who would win in a battle showdown, Canada versus Switzerland? And the notes say, oh, it doesn't matter. Both have abstained from conflict. So there you go. Someone has to win. It's why showdowns and sports are so exciting. Uh, uh, someone wins, someone loses. And what good is a tie? And losing, who likes losing? George Brett, the great baseball player, once said, if a tie is like kissing your sister, losing is like kissing your grandmother with her teeth out. <laughs> My brother and I had all kinds of showdowns. Uh, one with putting the ice cream back in the freezer empty infuriated me, so I packed dry Kool-Aid grape powder into his shower head because I knew he would take a shower. It exploded all over him, dark, deep purple. The bathroom was a mess. I cleaned it up, but the kid brother won. Yes, yes. Today we have a story about Jacob who was a kid brother, just barely. He was a twin, and at the moment of birth, he was losing the race to be born first. So the Bible says he reached out and grabbed his twin brother Esau by the heel and tried to pull him back. And so the name Jacob means heel grabber or schemer, trickster. Esau, the name, means big red, hairy. And so today's story is about Harry and Heel Grabber, two competitive brothers, and they're gearing up for a frightening showdown. Quick backstory on these two. Jacob and Esau's father, Isaac, favored Esau. Esau was a skilled hunter, a really good cook, but mom, Rebecca, favored Jacob, and neither parent trusted each other. They put the fun in dysfunctional. Isaac tried to go one day around the typical public ceremony of blessing the oldest son by, having, by doing it privately. Uh, private Rebecca, the wife, heard of this plan and thought, well, two can play this game. So she had Jacob dress up like Esau, wearing his hunting outfit, the camo, uh, tricked the father into blessing Jacob instead. And so Jacob, with his mom's help, cheated Esau out of his rightful inheritance as the firstborn son. Esau was enraged and declared openly he would kill his kid brother. So Jacob's next move, get out of Dodge, quick, leave town, leave my problems behind. But let's reflect, can you ever just move away from your problems? Have you noticed that wherever you go, you bring yourself with you? A big part of who you are is the family and people you're from. It's why sometimes we'll laugh out loud when we see us taking after our mom or, oh my goodness, that was my dad. I have become my dad. Right. So it's on Jacob's trip out from home, leaving, that he learns a first showdown lesson. And it's while sleeping, he looks up and sees you can't run away from God. And you can't control God on your own terms. Remember Jonah? Here we go again. After Jacob heads out of town, one night he falls asleep with a stone for a pillow. You think you've been in some bad hotels? 
And it's while sleeping in that place, he dreams of a ladder, Jacob's ladder, which means step right up, Jacob. You and your family now have access, ladder, and you will be a blessing of God's access and peace for all humanity. God told Jacob at Bethel, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham and Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Now it's interesting. When Abraham, Grandpa Abraham, heard God saying that to him, we read that he fell on his face in reverence. But listen to Jacob's response. If God will be with me and watch over me and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, then the Lord will be my God. Now Jacob offers God 10% of his blessings, asks for a safe return. But did you hear that if conditional response? He is still bargaining now with God on his terms. That's a lot of uh, uh, guts. Winston Churchill once said, I am ready to meet my maker. Whether my maker is prepared for the ordeal of meeting me is another matter. So Jacob has that spirit. And friends, the essence of idolatry is enjoying God or a God of your own design on your terms only. Jonah, do you remember? He said, I'll go serve on your missionary campaign, God, if they are the people I approve of first. No. God, cue the storm. God and Moses, do you remember Sinai? They were taking too long on the mountain to receive God's word. The crowd started complaining, getting restless. Hey, someone had an idea. Let's make a gold statue with our jewelry. We can pretend it will be our God. It will make us happy. That is right up until Moses and God came down with the law. Exactly. Idolatry is that godlike force in our lives uh, that you pretend you can manage on your own. But the real God of this world will not be remote controlled by us or anyone. The real God of this world will get in your face even to offer grace. And so Jacob learned is learning about this God. God, but God was still not the center of his life and world. Jacob still needed to learn another showdown lesson, and it's one that applies to all of us. It's not about you. You know, many people live with a different holy trinity in their lives, me, myself, and I. Yeah, that is right up until they read this book. Rick Warren, in his classic work, The Purpose Driven Life, has a powerful opening line. It's not about you. A key lesson of finding who you really are, remembering and realizing who you can be, is to realize your life is not just about you. And it's key to becoming unstuck. You, you discover that you were created to be in relationship, your life, with God and with the people God has given you for the purposes of God's mission and justice. Jacob believed he was the center of his world, and he couldn't see how God had bigger plans, plans of a holy family tree that would bring new life to all of humanity in God's covenant of blessing, a covenant that Pastor Ken referred to last week. And furthermore, Jacob couldn't see how despite his self-centeredness that God even still would not abandon him in spite of his scheming orientation. 
And so, friends, the best way to locate yourself in life and to become unlost is to see where you really are. I don't know about you, but whenever I use that little map app on my phone, I always have a little warm feeling. That's, oh, there I am. That's me. That's where I am. Now, that's geographically. Sometimes emotionally, I'm in other places. Counselors will often tr tell troubled people, you know, this is not all about you. Your parents likely weren't just upset, focused at you. They were likely upset at each other, and they took it out on you. It's not about you as the center. Just before our story in chapter 31, God told Jacob, it's time to go home. It's time to reconnect with your family and Esau, right? But the way for Jacob to finally come home was that he needed to locate himself first as the recipient of God's grace. And that's why as Jacob starts out in this story, he immediately receives a startling text message. Esau is on his way to meet you, and he has 400 men with him. Going home now meant showdown with the very brother he cheated, a brother with 400 soldiers. And so his response is fear. It's a showdown that is a clear mismatch. And it causes him to learn lesson number three. Don't just face your fears. Face God himself. Jake comes up with his best plan. You can read about it. He divides his company into different groups, <coughs> including the animals and herds and flocks. Each one is to go separately so that one can escape if there is an attack. And then after the animals, he sends out his family members, children and women first. It's kind of Jacob's way of saying, hey, Esau, please meet all of my adorable kids, uh, your nieces and nephews, Uncle Esau. Wouldn't it be terrible if they lost their daddy, Esau? And it's then we come to our reading today. Jacob is at last left completely alone. Utterly alone, he has what has been called a dark night of the soul. And he learns that facing God is the best way to face your fears. We read that a man approaches him as night falls and attacks Jacob. Jacob wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And at first he thought this man was maybe an angel, but by daybreak he realizes it was God himself in human form. Do you see what can come when you're alone and you offer yourself to God? In Jacob's struggle, he begins to learn who he really is. God asks him in the struggle, what is your name? And he has to respond, I am Jacob. I am the schemer. But watch this. God does not leave him there with that broken identity of seeing himself. He says, you will now be called Israel, which means you are the one who struggles with God. You are a God-governed man. Friends, in all of your life struggles, do you look just only for a way through or a way to become new and even renewed. And in your struggles, panics, anxieties, have you tried simply being still and calling upon the presence of God? You know, we Christians talk a lot about struggling with temptation, struggling with other people, struggling against the enemy. But the Bible says it's when we struggle with God that we can become renewed, real, and authentic. Calvin Miller, one of my favorite writers, a pastor, has reflected over his life on his struggles with God and what he's learned. He said, I limp now. 
I am so badly crippled I cannot walk without support. I know no independence. There is nothing good in my life that Jesus hasn't put there. I couldn't live a day without him. I have a new name, but I also have a brand new dependency. It's Jesus. Jesus became his Savior, but also his Lord. And so Jacob goes from wrestling with God all night to discovering something new. It's lesson four. With God, weakness can be turned into strength. The morning after his encounter with God, Jacob gets up, gets ready, and limps across the river to meet his brother. Limping. Was he strengthened that night and refreshed athletic training to meet his comeuppance brother? No. His wrestling wasn't a workout. It was a work through. And in his night of wrestling, he became physically weakened. And it's the part of God's touching Jacob's hip. The Bible uses a verb there for touch that is the lightest Hebrew word for touching you can use. A man just touches Jacob's hip. Right. And Jacob would be limping, but also still living. And please see this. His limp would be a mark of blessing rather than just weakness. For Jacob, his limp would be a sign of walking in God's spirit under God's guidance. The strength we receive from God is a strength for reuniting rather than dividing. We read after our story today that when the brothers finally do see each other, Esau goes running to embrace Jacob. All is forgiven. And some think that is the scene Jesus had in mind when he told his famous story about the prodigal son and the father who went running to receive back his delinquent son. And I wonder, did seeing his kid brother Jacob now limping have anything to do with that reconciliation? Friends, a way we can become new people, strengthened people, is by seeing how God can use our pains, our struggles, our crises to help make us grow and be a carrier of his grace. That's what sanctification is. It's a big fancy religious word that means growing more and more holy by God's care. It's the word from which we get the word saint. And one of the key ways we grow and become strong through life, strong to love, strong to care, strong to recover and help others recover, is through our own pains and aches. And lastly, friends, for all of us on our showdowns today, I think we need to see from today's story that the God of Jacob is our God of grace now. One of my favorite parts about this story, about Jacob limping and all, is how God continues to call himself the God of Jacob not the God of Israel. It's one of God's favorite names for himself, the God of Jacob. Even though Jacob has now been renamed Israel, God still refers to himself as the God of Jacob. And that means he is the God of sinners, schemers, tricksters. The God of Jacob is a name for God that says, I am the God of messed up families where there's conflict, lack of trust. I am the God of those who have trouble sleeping at night. I'm the God of those who are wrestling and struggling with a burden. I'm the God of those who are beginning to learn it's not all about them. The God of those who are realizing they can't do life all on their own. The God of Jacob. The God of those who are sinking down. I think I've told you before how when I was younger, I wanted to be a lifeguard. And I wanted to be a lifeguard, uh, not so much to save lives, but because I thought lifeguards were the coolest. I mean, you know, walking around with the whistle, 
you know, and shouting at kids to not run. Yeah, I wanted to be a lifeguard. And uh, this was high school time for me. And I passed the, the test, I applied, I took the test, I learned CPR, first aid, no problem, I'm doing it. The final exam to become certified as a lifeguard, right? Summer job, was to actually save someone out in the water. And I thought to myself, well, that makes sense. Lifeguard, save a life, sure. We were also told for our final exam, the person out there would be play acting drowning. Ooh, right? And, th and that the person would offer us resistance because that commonly happens in real life. I'm thinking, no problem. I'm a good swimmer. Got this. That morning of the final exam, we saw the person out in the deep end of the pool where you can't touch. It was Mr. Terry Downey, the vice principal of our high school, the weightlifting coach for our high school, the wrestling coach, the assistant football trainer for our high school squad. Mr. Downey had so many muscles, his arms never hung down straight. They were always kind of out like this, and his shirts were always tight from these muscles and short biceps. Yeah. And he was legendary in our high school uh, for the amount of weight he could bench press. He could bench press the bench press machine. Yeah. There was school lore that once there were two bad boys smoking in the bathroom, and he just lifted both of them by their shirts with one arm. Yeah, that Mr. Downey out in the deep end. Come and get me, Ross. I need saving. I swam out with my little stick teenage arms. Right? I swam out, and I won't forget on my first few tries, he just with one hand pushed me underwater like I was a little rubber duck in a bathtub. So I dove deep, got past his arms, got close to him, and I threw my little asparagus arms around his chest like this, and he started bending me in different ways like a cheap lawn chair at Dollar General, just right? I'm holding on. Finally, I had my chance. I, I got a part of his armpit and I just pinched. And he calmed down. And I realized there was hope. And I started pulling him into the edge of the pool. Now, here's the, here's the new twist on this story as I have thought about it. For years, and I may even have told you this, I thought it was my pinch move that worked. I thought it was my little... 17-year-old hand grabbing his arm that made him quiet down so I could pull him in. It was me. It wasn't me. I've thought about Mr. Downey and how he was such a revered educator in our small town. Remarkable man. And I realized just a few weeks ago, Terry Downey allowed me to win. He allowed me to pull him to the side of the pool. And realizing who he is as an educator, it's also dawned on me, he let me win because he knew it would be good for me to become a lifeguard and to work the role of maybe saving and helping others. Is God in your wrestling maybe letting you live, <laughs> letting you win, letting you continue? Because God in his powerful grace wants you to become a lifeguard for others, a life force of blessing for someone else. God let Jacob survive so that he could become a part of a life-saving family through the years that would one day produce a Jesus of Nazareth. And it would be Jesus who would face the biggest wrestling match of all time. 
Jesus would face the darkness of all of our scheming, self-centeredness, sin, and Jesus would let go and give in. It's because Jesus wasn't doing this. He did this. And in his dying, he took upon himself the penalties of all our errors and selfishness. He would suffer and die. Someone would have to lose. Jesus gave his life away so that we can win today. Will you let Jesus touch you and let his strength and life give you life? God, uh, we're likely all at different places this morning. There's some of us here who are just happy and thankful. And there's others of us here, Lord, who are in the midst of tough burdens, tough struggles. And Lord, for some here, it, life right now just seems to really hurt. God, help us to not be afraid to come to you, even if it means wrestling. And Jesus, please, in your mercy, touch us. Redirect us. Heal us. Give us your life, Jesus, that we will be a part of your life-saving mission in this world. Jesus, in your name, we give thanks and pray. Amen.